Welcome to our session today, Best Practices in Online Teaching. We're so glad that you have joined us today, whether it's for this live uh, workshop that we're offering online, or perhaps you're viewing the archive of today's session. Either way, we're so glad that you have joined us. My name is Jason Rohde, and I am the director with the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University here. And a little bit about me, uh, I've been teaching online using Blackboard since 2001, and in addition to my many responsibilities with the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center, um, I do teach in the Department of Educational Technology, Research and Assessment here in the College of Education. And uh, most recently, I designed and taught a fully online accelerated course this past fall. It was 10 weeks in length as part of the um, technology specialist uh, graduate program uh, that we have there within the, the College of Ed. And uh, so anyway, if, if anyone here today uh, is interested in trying something new when it comes to teaching with technology, um, please feel free to contact myself or really anyone here within the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center. And I'll, I'll be sure to put my contact info up at the end of our session here today as well. And also, while not joining us today, I do want to give special thanks to Angela Velez Solik and Jeff Geronimo. Uh, they're both colleagues of mine um, at other institutions. And uh, they've each shared some of these tips and helped contribute to today's session. So I wanted to put a shout out to them as well and, and thank them for their uh, contributions. Now, as we uh, get started today, and just want to quickly highlight kind of what we're planning to accomplish uh, in today's session today. We're going to focus on some best practices and strategies to keep in mind when you're teaching online. And uh, so whether you're completely new to online teaching or maybe you've already uh, you've had some degree of experience teaching online, uh, today we're going to review uh, the current state of online teaching and learning very briefly, and then we'll explore uh, some tips and some best practices when it comes to design, delivery, and assessment uh, within online courses. And along the way, we'll look to examine some strategies for leveraging uh, different types of technology tools uh, to support these tips and best practices. So uh, by the end, um, I'm, I'm hoping to also uh, share some resources if you're interested um, in further exploring online teaching best practices. I'll also mention um, how you can have access to a sample online course um, that I designed following some best practices in online course design. So stay tuned um, for that. So to start, let's talk briefly about the state of online teaching and learning. Um, online classes, uh, they have become much more common in recent years. Uh, and according to a study by the Babson Survey Research Group, and the College Board, in 2012, over 7 million students were enrolled in at least one online course. And in 2012, 33.5% of all higher education students in the U.S. were enrolled in at least one online course. And that's those are some really impressive numbers. The growth that we've seen is, has really been steady over time uh, in terms of the number of students that are uh, taking online courses. And we're seeing uh, the growth is indeed widespread uh, in terms of online learning. Uh, the Pew Research Center uh, reported back in 2011 that more than three quarters of college presidents uh, at that time reported that their institutions uh, offer online courses. And so what does that mean? You know, we, we use this term, online course, and uh, we, that gets thrown around quite a bit uh, nowadays. And there are in fact, establish definitions for what constitutes an online course. Um, for example, the Sloan Consortium, which is a leading organization committed to quality education online, has formalized the definition for an online course as being where 80 or more percent of the content of a course is delivered online, typically having no face-to-face -face meetings. Now, there are other variations of, of online. This, this term. Uh, and, and that may include things such as blended or hybrid courses that blend online and face-to-face -face delivery, as well as what we would term web-facilitated courses that use web-based technology such as 
a course management system like Blackboard to help facilitate, which is essentially a face-to-face -face course. And uh, most recently, we're seeing uh, even um, some hybrids within that where we hear things called blended or hybrid programs, which may include some fully online courses uh, mixed in with uh, some actual face-to-face -face, uh, experiences. Um, so there's a whole wide assortment of flavors uh, of, of online. Um, and we're going to focus really today on just the, at the course level and, and not talk as much about uh, programs. But the Higher Learning Commission also um, does have a, uh, a definition um, that I, I do want to just draw everyone's attention to so everyone is familiar. Um, and, and that being that online courses, uh, HLC refers to them as distance education courses. That's the term that HLC uses. And uh, what HLC, the differentiation that HLC makes uh, is in calling what are termed self-paced courses they're termed correspondence education courses. So the commission defines a distance education course as one in which 75% or more of the instruction, meaning the actual time that's spent on the course content, is offered by distance education. And the commission therefore defines distance education courses as being instructor-led, drawing the distinction between correspondence education courses, uh, those would be self-paced. So we're, we see that online courses have indeed, they've been recognized as unique and increasingly popular modes for instruction, uh, distinct from face-to-face -face or other education delivery methods. So if you're here today and you're brand new to the world of online teaching and learning, uh, let me mention a few tips right off the bat that you might find useful before getting your feet too wet in this, this world of, of online teaching. And I think for those of us that are experienced, I think these will be uh, great reminders as well. Uh, but first of all, uh, for those of you that are brand new to online teaching, I recommend that you try to use different kinds of online technologies in your face-to-face -face or blended courses first, if possible, so that then you can get a good idea of how you might use the technology to com teach completely online. Now, even if you just start out by using Blackboard for posting grades or uh, sharing some resources with your students, you'll be amazed at how uh, you can use all these tools in so many different ways. Uh, you can look for opportunities to incorporate online technologies from uh, the course management system, which here at NIU we have Blackboard as our, our course management system. You can use that in so many different ways to enhance your face-to-face -face instruction. And also, while this might not be true if for everyone's situation, um, if you haven't taught the course face-to-face, -face, if possible, try teaching it that way first, if you can, so you can fully understand the course components and the student needs, so that that way along the way, you'll see what works and what doesn't. And you might uh, be able to have a, a solid idea of how to approach the same class in a fully online environment. Now, again, this isn't required by any means, but it certainly is helpful if, if you have that chance to teach that course first face-to-face. -face. Now, lastly, uh, I would recommend to uh, discuss and network with colleagues who have some experience teaching online. And, and many of you logged in here today, I know, have a previous experience, and you've taught online before. Um, you're some of our, our greatest uh, resources here uh, in terms of, of your expertise and what works and, and uh, things that can be improved upon. So uh, I'd encourage you to look for those that would be willing to share with you some of their own tips and their best practices, uh, especially looking for those um, that perhaps teach in the same subject area. I know that uh, is always just uh, increasingly helpful if you can see the same kinds of subject matter um, that someone else has, has taught online. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm, I will give you the opportunity to, to have access to a sample online course I've done, uh, recently developed just as a, an idea if you're interested in that. So now let's, let's talk a little bit about um, really the components of an online course. We've, 
we've looked at the definition of an online course, but let's identify some of these common components that you'll likely find in every online course. Now, even though every course is different, there are some elements that I think all online courses do have in common. And these would be communication, content delivery, collaboration, and assessment. And during today's workshop, we obviously don't have uh, all the time in the world here today to discuss every facet uh, in full detail. But uh, we'll specifically look at course design, at content delivery, and assessment. And uh, you'll notice along the way, as we talk about these and, and we share some some tips and some best practices here, that, that they will cross over and they'll blend with each other. So uh, don't at all be alarmed if you see some tips um, that are in fact related to uh, each other. So now uh, let's start here. What we're going to do is take a look at some of these tips and best practices for different components of teaching an online course. And then we'll specifically narrow them down. Uh, like I said, to design, to delivery, and to gr grading aspects of online courses. So along the way, I'll be mentioning some technologies that you might use to leverage some of these best practices. Um, now just note that while it, it might sound like I'm making a sales pitch maybe for some of these technologies, I'm really not. Um, the technologies that I'll mention here today are ones that are accessible to you here uh, at NIU, and they are the ones that are supported centrally, like Blackboard. Um, so, of course, I'll mention perhaps some other tools as well, and if you know of any as we go through uh, some of these tips, there's other tools that you want to share, uh, please mention them in the text chat, by all means, chime in. Um, so with that in mind, we'll first take a look at some of uh, tips and best practices to keep in mind when you're designing online courses. And as we look through some of these, and keep in mind these are only just a few of the many tips that are out there, think about what you might be able to do to improve the design of your online course if, you, if you've taught online previously. Uh, and, and remember that even if you've never taught an online course before, these are some great tips and strategies to keep in mind if you ever do decide to venture into this mode of, of online teaching. Uh, so again, if you have any tips or suggestions that you'd like to share with everyone as we go along, please go ahead and post them in the text chat on the left-hand side. Uh, I'll do my best to try to field any of these comments and questions during the session. And if you're using a microphone here today and you'd like to ask a live question, like I said, um, just click on that little uh, hand raise icon at any point in time. So the first tip that I would offer as you are thinking about designing an online course is to rethink your syllabus. Use this as an opportunity to evaluate your current syllabus that you use in your face-to-face -face instruction and look to create a loophole-free syllabus, meaning try to make it as comprehensive and detailed as possible while also keeping it succinct and easy to understand. Uh, so think of it uh, in terms of everything that students could possibly jump through. What are some of the sections that you might want to include in addition to the common sections of a syllabus? You know, some of these might be some of your guidelines on grading or your policies on late work and maybe even some of your conventions for formatting of files when students submit assignments. And when you meet with your students face to face, often you're clarifying those aspects of your syllabus in person. And as you move online, you want to try to uh, clarify and, and, and detail some of those uh, areas so that uh, it's clear to the students what those expectations are. And something you might want to try is to create a syllabus quiz then to make sure that the students know exactly what's expected of them. Um, so you could actually set that up that, and could be a requirement in your course that the students complete that before they, they move on. Um, also another tip um, is to, uh, to, that will simplify your life when it comes to setting up your online courses to try to keep your due dates and other important dates in one place. Uh, where they're listed, most likely in your course, uh, maybe a course schedule that is perhaps part of your syllabus or maybe you, it's a separate document, something that you, you post for your students. But if you put the dates uh, in other areas of your course, maybe if you list the due dates, um, and some faculty, myself in particular, I like to do this uh, and include the due dates as part of maybe the folder name in Blackboard when I'm organizing materials. Um, the problem when you do that 
is then with that approach is uh, when you reteach that same course in the future, you'll have to change those dates in multiple places. And that obviously takes up a lot of valuable time. Um, so in my own experience, if uh, you're able to, uh, to keep those due dates in a single spot, um, it, it just makes the updating uh, very easy and as easy as possible. Um, something that I recommend doing is for any assignment that you have in Blackboard, when you set that up, and if it's an assignment that students are submitting electronically, so maybe it's a, a paper uh, using the assignment tool or maybe it's a quiz, uh, you can assign a due date at that point in time uh, right there and it will actually show up in the course calendar. And those are very easy to change as well when you uh, repeat your course in the future. So next, uh, thinking about organizing your content. Another tip is to uh, organize your course content and specifically in some kind of a folder structure, something like you see here in the slide. So when you organize folders in your online course, then you might want to decide to structure your course content into weekly folders. Maybe you do it where you have a week one folder, a week two, an example, uh, you know, like I have here, like you see here on the, the screen. Um, and, and this would be a good approach, let's say, if you had um, if you're structuring your course by, by calendar, you also could do it by topic or theme. Um, so you, you can see the kind of the example here on the right is where you see some of the different topics are listed. Uh, and this might be a good approach if you have maybe five major themes in your course and students will be spending a certain amount of time in each theme. Um, so rather than trying to break everything up by weeks, uh, a thematical or topical approach might be a better option in that case. So one way or the other, come up with a, a, a way of organizing your content that makes sense to you and makes sense to your students. And also, if you haven't explored it yet, I'd strongly encourage you to consider using the Blackboard Content Collection system to help organize your course content. Now, the Blackboard Content Collection, it, it, it allows NIU faculty to easily and efficiently store, share, and manage their course content. The content collection feature, it fully integrates within uh, your Blackboard course and it provides an easy way for you to uh, uh, post content without the need for duplication. So to give you a brief example, let's say that you upload your course syllabus in the content collection and then uh, you link it to your course. Now, any time you have to make changes to that syllabus, um, you know, the next time you teach the course, for example, you simply overwrite the file in the content collection, uh, that syllabus, that single file, and it automatically makes those changes in your course. So you, then you don't have to delete and re-upload files into the course itself. Um, this is perfect if you teach the course regularly. Uh, in that way, you'd only uh, update or tweak that one syllabus file, and then it gets updated everywhere. Uh, another example would be if multiple colleagues were teaching the same section, and they're using the same uh, content or same, some of the same course files. Uh, if something needs to be changed, it could be updated in one place and then every instance of that file is updated everywhere uh, within the system. So it's, it's a great time saver and it, it works really great uh, when, when faculty are looking to, to share files and resources. Uh, and this idea of overwriting files is, is really key. Rather than uploading you know, multiple versions of the same thing, uh, just overwriting a single file is, is uh, definitely the way to go. So uh, this is something that you can very easily do within Blackboard and, and uh, I can follow up with more details if you'd like to learn more and, and set up, get started using the Blackboard content collection. In fact, for those of you participating live, um, we do have a, a workshop this next week, in fact, about using the Blackboard content collection. Um, you can look for that in our list of upcoming workshops um, and you can certainly sign up and be a part of that. We do offer workshops throughout the year on the Blackboard Content Collection and have some great resources available online as well. Another important tip as you're thinking about structuring your course is to put as much content as possible in one place, uh, but also be mindful of how everything is structured so that you and your students avoid any unnecessary clicking. 
and I have this joke here on the slide that says no folderception, uh, which if you've seen the movie Inception, you know what I'm talking about um, here. But basically, when you're putting content in your course, try not to organize it by putting folders within folders within folders within folders, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that just makes, if you do that, for a navigational nightmare. And the content is, is really not at all accessible because of the, the number of levels that you have. Uh, and I'm the kind of person, I like to put things in, in their place. And I tend to be this kind of person where I, I nest things too deep. Um, so I personally try to stick to you know, maybe only two levels, uh, you know, one to two levels of, of folders, and that's it to avoid this, this folderception, if you will, uh, where we have just too many layers of, of folders there. Another practical tip when it comes to, and, and this is just from my experience um, sharing content with students uh, over a decade, is when at all possible, work on saving everything in PDF. Um, now, there are a few exceptions, of course, but if you convert uh, your PowerPoint presentations or Word documents or whatever to PDF, uh, it makes them more accessible to students. And it also is a much smaller file size and easier for them to access uh, over a slower uh, connection. Now, this, this tip is uh, definitely valuable if you want to post maybe PowerPoint presentations. The PowerPoint files, they can eat up a lot of space, especially if you put a lot of diagrams, charts, and so forth. But if you convert them to PDF, um, they do uh, it does, in, in a sense, kind of reduce that file size. Plus, uh, students then won't be able to edit and tinker with your slides. So it protects your presentation from getting mishandled in a way. But, and I'll throw this in here, I have to note that when you're saving everything in PDF, also keep the source files. And I can't tell you how many times I've saved documents assignments or tutorials in PDF, but then I forgot to save the source file. And so then what happens? Well, if I need to make changes later to the PDF, it's a big challenge because I can't find the original document to edit. And while you can technically edit PDF files, it can be a, a big hassle. So uh, take my advice and make sure that if you do decide to save content in PDF form, which I, I do recommend, be sure to keep the source files in a safe place. Uh, in Blackboard, you can actually upload the, uh, the source file along with the PDF and just hide the PDF. That's one approach that I often take just so I have a backup there um, within the course. You can do the same thing in the content collection or obviously on your own computer. Just keep a, keep a folder where you keep the source files uh, in that editable format. Now something else as you're thinking about you know, what components your online course will have and how you'll structure it would be to create a start here area where you'll orient your learners to your course. Uh, and this especially helpful if, uh, you know, if you don't have any face-to-face -face meetings with your students, when they log into your course for the first time, it's really helpful to give them a place where you uh, will have information about navigating the online course and maybe some, some resources for tech support. Um, you could put your syllabus in this area, but I find that many faculty um, typically make a content link dedicated just to the syllabus and the course schedule. So that, that perhaps gets its own separate area. Um, now for those of you that are familiar with uh, this idea of, of screencasting, um, or that's capturing full motion video of what's happening on the, the computer. Um, you could use a free tool like Jing to create a course tour to walk students through the course. Um, sometimes, especially for visual learners, um, creating just a simple five minute course tour video uh, can make a, a world of difference um, to the learners. Um, Isabel, you, I, I see your question in the text chat about uh, back to my comments about uh, converting to PDF, can you add audio files into the PDF? Um, depending on the, the, the software application that you're using, there are ways of having a PDF file that can play and have audio. Um, it's not something natively that PowerPoint does. Um, and so uh, if that's something you're interested in doing, Isabel, follow up with us and we can, we can chat more offline about what those possibilities are. Um, 
And Donna, you mentioned uh, repeating the name of the free program for video capture. Sure, um, it's called uh, Jing, and I'll put it in the text chat here. Yeah, Jing is one of them um, that's free. It's basically a free version of something called Camtasia, uh, which is a, another piece of software that I think in, in CHHS um, that you all have um, some licenses for. There are a wide number of, of software tools. And, uh, and, and Donna, yes, the uh, Jing is basically the free version. Uh, what it does is it, it doesn't let you edit after the fact, so it's kind of a, a quick and dirty record of, of something that happened, and then you can post it in your course very quickly. Um, and that's often what I use uh, because it, it, it gets the job done. I don't need to, to do a lot of editing. Uh, it forces me from doing a lot of editing and spending time doing that. So, um, but using some kind of a tool to record just a quick tour for the students is, uh, I find, is, is really helpful and cuts down on the, the questions that you'll, you'll be facing as you go through the course. So great questions, everybody. Um, another, another tip here is to, when at all possible, design less and teach more. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, from my experience, I found that um, definitely uh, it's not good. It's not a good idea to try to design a course, develop it, and teach it at the same time. Um, and I, uh, I've had instances where I've had to do that, where, uh, you know, uh, you get a, an assignment, you know, a couple weeks before the semester starts to teach a course. And uh, in fact, the course I taught this past fall was kind of that way, where I, I didn't have a lot of time up front to do, uh, you know, the design and development up front. I was doing that kind of as it was going, and it was a lot of work. Um, and so, if at all possible, um, try to have the course as developed as you can before the start of the semester. So then you can focus more on the, the more important aspects of the course, which is teaching the course, obviously. Um, and so one of the things you can do in Blackboard is you can use date restrictions and adaptive release to accelerate and remediate student learning. So in Blackboard, you can use date restrictions to any piece of content or content folders um, so that you could have a fully developed course, but each of the components become available on the day or time that you designate. Um, and so this is a great way if your course is structured into weekly units, uh, which is often how I uh, kind of tend to structure my courses. Um, if you do that, you could set the, the weekly unit folders, for example, to automatically turn on at the day and time when you want them to become available. Otherwise, you might give students more flexibility uh, by using something called adaptive release. And what this does is it creates conditions that would unlock content only after they've completed some required prerequisites. For example, if you, I mentioned earlier having a syllabus quiz in your online course. If you had a syllabus quiz that the students had to review, um, if they don't answer the questions correctly in the syllabus quiz, the rest of the course material doesn't unlock. So maybe you set the quiz that they, it can be taken repeatedly until the student gets all the questions correct. And at that point in time, and only at that time, then do they get access to you know, maybe the first week's materials. So uh, that's just one way in which uh, you could structure and, and kind of release content using adaptive release. Um, I also use adaptive release on my assignment submission links. So that, for example, students won't be able to submit assignment two unless they've submitted assignment one, and so on and so forth. So, um, so you can, uh, you have a lot of flexibility in how you can let the system do the heavy lifting in terms of releasing content to the students. And then once you're teaching your course, uh, consider keeping a journal log of your course for future revisions. Uh, Some place where you can jot down as you're going through the course, oh, next time I teach it, I want to make sure I make this adjustment. Um, I use a tool, you can use something like Evernote, uh, which is a tool I use. Uh, it's web-based, but it also has mobile apps, and, and you can get to it on your computer or uh, mobile device. Uh, but it, it allows you to you know, just quickly jot down a note, uh, or maybe just have a simple notepad, someplace where you're keeping notes about tweaks and features that you might want to change in the future. And if these tweaks and changes are minor and they don't impact the, you know, the overall uh, outcomes in terms of what you've stated will be covered in the syllabus, uh, you, you can go ahead and change them right then and there. Um, 
you know, if there are major areas, you know, major errors, you know, you can jump in and you can fix those, you know, right away as you're you know, in the process of, of teaching the course. Another tip in, in terms of, of content, and this will be kind of my, my closing uh, set of tips here in terms of your content, is to rethink your content a bit. And you know, before we move on to talking about delivery, uh, I want you to maybe rethink your course content. And I'll, I'll put this suggestion out there. You know, sometimes as I work with faculty, um, they often think that just because they're teaching a course online that they have to create all the materials from scratch. Uh, and they have to record all of these lectures and, and presentations and things. And, and while there may be the need to do some of that, that's not necessarily true. Um, there are just tons of open educational resources out there, um, things like YouTube videos and TED Talks and, and many more uh, open resources, things that uh, you could incorporate into your course. Um, Blackboard even allows you now to include these types of media directly within the text editor when you're creating your content, so that you can you can you know utilize the rich uh, many resources that are out there. Now, uh, when you're trying to working with media, and we do separate workshops about different ways you can use media in your courses, try to embed the media whenever uh, possible within the course instead of just linking out to it. And um, you can also use the built-in media tools in Blackboard, like I mentioned, to grab the content and embed it directly within your course. You don't need to know any HTML coding. Um, uh, usually, you can just put it right in there. But from the learner's perspective, when you do embed the content, when you make it available directly in the course without having to leave Blackboard, it's just easier then for them to be able to see and view it uh, without having to click on multiple links and opening up new windows. Uh, it just keeps the course experience much more personal without uh, too many distractions. So try to embed uh, those resources whenever ever possible. So uh, I'm going to pause at this point and just see if there are any other questions. I'm gonna, I just want to scan through the text chat. And if there are any questions, you can put those in the text chat at this point. Otherwise, I think we are good to move on to have our next set of uh, best practices here, some tips for uh, delivery. So let's, let's take a look now at uh, some tips that when you're delivering your content and teaching your course, you may find helpful. Now some of these tips do blend some aspects of organization and uh, communication uh, in online courses. And so don't be surprised as we're going through these if you see some tips that belong in some different categories. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, what are some effective and efficient ways to delivering um, your content. And uh, Wendy, I see the, the comment here. Uh, while I comment about copyright issues or can provide a link where you can incorporate uh, films that you're currently using in face-to-face -face classes. I'm not going to get in, I don't have time, Wendy, to spend too much into some copyright, but I will follow up and uh, I'll send out uh, some resources that you might find helpful. Um, if you have a, a full-length film um, that you're looking to incorporate or if it's chunks of films, um, there are some, some approaches in terms of how you might go about that. Um, if it's a, a portion, you know, under fair use, if it's a clip, um, that is, is usually much easier to do um, if you're trying to incorporate an entire uh, film, for example, into an online course, um, a documentary. Okay, so in that in that case, um, you know, there are some some ways you can go about doing that. There's there's two sides to it, right? There's the um, just from the the technical standpoint, you know, how do I digitize it? Where do I put it and, and make it available? And then the second piece is is just from the the, uh, the copyright standpoint uh, of having the access uh, and the permission to be able to do that. And uh, Dan Cabrera our, uh, in our staff here in our center, he's kind of our, our guru in terms of, of this area, so I may defer some of this to them. But I'll follow up, uh, Wendy, through email with, uh, with some, some helpful uh, resources in that regard. So uh, in terms of, of delivery and planning your delivery, I'm just going to throw a, a few tips here um, out, some things just to think about. One would be to use announcements uh, weekly 
and um, and then save those in a file where you can easily access them later, especially if you're going to teach the same course multiple times. And what you can do is you can copy and paste the announcements uh, then later on, and you can tweak them as necessary without it having to start from scratch. Um, and this is where it would be a good idea to use the date restriction feature in Blackboard. So what this does is you can plan and you can actually write out your announcements ahead of time and then you can post date them so that they automatically unlock at the right date and time. So not all learning management systems do this kind of thing, but uh, in Blackboard this is something you can do. So you could actually kind of pre-set up those announcements and, and then you could just be tweaking them as you go. Um, this is also the same for um, discussion posts that you want to make or uh, communications that you might have with students. If there are some general responses that you find you're often you know, putting into discussions, uh, you might want to just keep those in a, you know, a document somewhere where as you're writing those, you, you've got those at, you know, at your fingertips and you can easily then uh, reuse them. And another tip is that you know, every online class um, that you have, you, you probably want to have a folder on your computer uh, or perhaps you, you use a tool like Dropbox and you keep some of those files in the cloud. I, I personally use uh, Dropbox myself and uh, you can set up a free account. Uh, you get several gigs of, of space um, and it's available on all devices. And one of the neat things about Dropbox is it syncs. So if you put something in a, your Dropbox on your computer, you automatically have, a, have it on maybe your laptop or your mobile device and you could keep some of those uh, working files where you're keeping you know, those discussion responses and so forth uh, and have access to them from wherever you are. Now this next tip uh, is uh, to run from the email monster <laughs> and while it might seem a little funny at first, uh, being tied to email or feeling compelled to answer email, it can be a real nightmare for many online faculty. I know I've, I've often had that feeling where you know, you've got this load of email that you've got to get to and you have to respond and yeah, Isabel, absolutely. <laughs> um, so a few tips as you are running from the email monster and, and really just trying to get a handle on just email in general when it comes to teaching online, uh, one would be to um, hold some virtual office hours um, using uh, you know, whether it's Blackboard Collaborate or Adobe Connect or there's a number of different tools you could use. But if you have some virtual office hours, it could be a place where students know they can come and ask those questions without just emailing you. Um, something that, that I always do in my online courses, and if any of you that have worked with me before, you know I, I preach this, and that's to have a, a place in your discussion board, uh, a place where students can ask questions. And you can set up that forum, and I often call it my help forum or questions and answers, but it's a place where you can then subscribe yourself to that discussion forum and, and then those questions that students post there publicly, you receive it as an email, uh, you then can go ahead and you can respond in the discussion board in Blackboard, uh, and it's as if you are emailing that student, but you're doing it publicly so that all the students benefit from that. So you're not, you know, answering the same question over and over again in email. Um, I already mentioned the use of announcements, and this is a great way of, again, proactively answering questions. And when you post announcements in Blackboard, they, they, you can set them to uh, email to the student as well, so they get that same announcement as an email, um, and they have that available. Uh, you also might want to try uh, something like Remind 101 or Google Voice for text messages. So it could be an alternative that uh, where you want to maybe just send out a quick a text reminder rather than using email. Nice thing about a text message, of course, is that you're restricted to just 100 and, uh, 160 characters. So it's it's a very brief. Uh, tool and, and I've offered workshops in the past on using both Remind 101 and Google Voice where you can, uh, you don't have to give out your, your own personal, you're not using your mobile number um, and in, in the case of Remind 101 the students can't even reply back. It's really a, a more of a push type of a, a communication to, uh, to your students. But along those lines as we're thinking about 
email. Um, I think it's really important that we rethink email in terms of um, setting a realistic time schedule. Um, you know, set up some email access on your mobile device so that it, you don't have to, you know, open up your computer. Uh, but encourage also other avenues of, of communication. Uh, there are some things you can do in terms of using email filters where uh, from, if they come from a certain group of uh, users, those automatically go into a folder that you can then deal, you know, respond to at a particular time. Um, there are things you can do in that regard. Um, and in terms of just scheduling and setting a schedule, uh, you may want to just free yourself by uh, giving yourself a schedule that you then stick to so that you don't need to be on 24-7. Um, you know, you do need to be active, though, with your emails. And so uh, you might set reminders if you have a hectic schedule. But just to have a realistic time schedule for reading and responding to emails that you can stick with. So I personally, I try to read my emails twice a day, uh, you know, my course-related emails first thing in the morning when I'm in the office at 8 a.m. I'll set apart, you know, some time there. And then at the end of the day, uh, usually around 4, 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. But, um, you know, throughout the day then, if those are the times when you're emailing, you can tell your students, you know, whatever those times are for you so that they don't expect, you know, a response at 3 in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, so I try to stick to that twice a day schedule and I, I let my students know what that, what that schedule is. As we think about uh, content now and kind of moving beyond PowerPoint, I mean, the, the, the kind of a traditional and, and often working with faculty, I hear faculty who want to, you know, put their PowerPoints in, you know, online for their students, but you can move beyond that. You can add audio narration to PowerPoint slides, and this is a, an example from uh, Dr. Thomas Smith, uh, associate professor in, in the Etcher department, of how he uses um, something called Adobe Connect, which we have available here on campus, um, that you can record, uh, have your PowerPoint open, you can record your audio, it packages up in a format that then students can, it plays nicely on their computer and they can, they can uh, hear you and they can see your slides and it, it requires minimal hardware. Um, it's really quite easy for you to, to, use, to do that. Um, and you can do other things such as uh, recording face-to-face -face lectures or um, you know, even recording yourself using a webcam and, and making that available. You know, another alternative increasingly that you have is to make use of live online sessions for delivering content and, you know, facilitating online discussion. So in your online courses, you could choose to have live online sessions scheduled periodically throughout your course where you would require students to log in at a scheduled time um, and they could log in from either their computer or their mobile device and then they're participating in a live class meeting where you are perhaps presenting content as well as maybe you're facilitating a, a variety of different you know, types of discussions. Uh, in the screenshot I have here on the slide, this is me leading a live online class meeting uh, from my online course this past fall uh, from my comfy lazy boy chair in the basement at my home. And uh, during this particular class session, I not only presented some content for my students in the form of, you know, PowerPoint slides, but I also broke the students then into some small groups. I had them discuss and brainstorm ideas together in small breakout groups online and then brought them all back together so that they could share results of their brainstorming. So there's a ton that you can do with live online sessions. And unfortunately, we don't have the time here today to, to get deep into those specifics, but um, feel free to follow up with me or any of my colleagues in faculty development if you'd like to explore you know, the use of online live technology more. We do offer you know, hands-on workshops and we're also available to meet individually if you'd like assistance. But the one recommendation I do want to make sure to share for those of you who are considering incorporating live online sessions is that you let students know in advance, if at all possible, what the expectations are for participating. So one of the things I do is I put the dates for my live online sessions in my course syllabus and I prominently display them in my course so that the students know right away what the expectations are and then they can plan their schedules accordingly. So if you're going to require that participation, let them know that up front. 
beyond using the synchronous tools, something else that you can do is develop your presence in the course. And you can do very simple things like uh, recording a video of you, you know, talking to the students, giving them you know, insights or guidance. This is an example here of, of a kind of a welcome to the unit that's posted within my unit folder. Uh, in my online course. Um, you can do this kind of a thing not only in a content area, but in announcements, in discussions. Uh, you can use video in, in increasing ways to develop that sense of, of presence uh, in the course. Uh, Wendy, you make the comment about there's an assumption that we use PowerPoint. You certainly do not have to use uh, PowerPoint. And, and my apologies if, if that was coming across that you definitely had to do that. Um, your, your question is, if we, if we rely on PowerPoint, aside from synchronous, uh, what are my recommendations? So in terms of you, if you don't rely on that and you want to um, you know, have ways of presenting that content, there's lots of things you can do. There's something, Wendy, in Blackboard called learning modules or uh, that you can set up where you can take, uh, you can kind of take some, some, maybe it's some text with some diagrams, and you can kind of piece that together in such a way that the students can do that. Uh, you certainly can record a, just a quick what's called a screencast again of it could be uh, maybe you have a, an application or, or document or something open on your screen and you're going to talk through that um, with your students. Uh, and it can be some creative things as well where you take maybe a video and maybe they watch uh, you know a clip from a video and then maybe there's some uh, something from you, a message, you know, a, maybe a five minute mini lecture or something from you on a topic and then back to the video. Um, there's a lot of creative things you can do uh, if you don't use PowerPoint, which you certainly don't need to use PowerPoint if you teach online. Um, and, and certainly, Wendy, follow up with us if, if we can help in any way with you know, discussing that further. We'd love to explore some possibilities more with that. Uh, lots of options out there. Now, as we're wrapping up here quickly, I do want to uh, share a few tips about uh, just assessment and, and talk briefly about some strategies for uh, you know, how you might assess learners in your online course. So one would be to uh, rethink and revisit, uh, if you will, just your overall grading strategies uh, for your course. So one thing you may want to do is, is make sure that you're using grading criteria and rubrics for all assignments and discussions uh, so that it's clear to the students how they're being assessed. But it also saves you time in uh, being able to more quickly provide that feedback for the students. Uh, you can incorporate low stakes quizzes uh, within uh, your course, and then you can allow multiple attempts if you want that drill and practice kind of experience for your students. Um, look to provide feedback and allow the students uh, the opportunity to perhaps revise their assignments um, if, if you have that flexibility in your course. And so there are ways of tech, uh, to facilitate that within in Blackboard. Um, and perhaps try project-based learning, where maybe you have a series of assignments that are all part of a final project, and they, they kind of sequence and build upon one another. Uh, you may want to think about that approach. It works really well online, uh, especially if you use groups to have students work sequentially uh, on a project as it builds throughout the course. You also may want to consider, as you're thinking about moving online, some different grading methods. Um, you know, and, and revisiting how you're currently grading. Um, you can download uh, submissions from an LMS, and you can annotate those in Microsoft Word. You can do that right now. There are other ways uh, within Blackboard. There is a, we have a feature now called inline uh, grading, which if a student submits a paper, for example, uh, through Blackboard, you can actually grade it directly within Blackboard without having to download the file. So you can add comments. You can annotate. Um, you know, within it, much like you could do in Microsoft Word. Um, and you can also use rubrics with audio and video feedback. So you do have the capability in Blackboard to actually record a video or audio of you providing you know, feedback directly to the student um, that can be much richer than just you know, a text comment. Um, so you, you do have those options um, as well. And uh, Blackboard is working on the ability, an integrated ability in the Blackboard mobile app to be able to grade with a mobile device. Um, and there are some, some apps right now that you can use if you download the assignments that you can grade uh, on a mobile device. And then uh, it's still somewhat clunky to get them back into Blackboard. Um, Blackboard is working on a, a more integrated solution uh, where it will be much easier 
hopefully in the coming months to be able to do that. So, so just keep your eyes out for more details about that. Um, but there are other you know, technologies and tools for grading. But think about what works right now for grading for you. And as you're moving online, perhaps be open to considering some different grading methods. I already alluded to this, but I think it's really key to give and receive feedback for your students. So you know, one of the things you can do is save samples and uh, phrases from your feedback. And then you can copy and paste those in as appropriate. So I try to keep a, like a text file for each assignment type in my course, where as I'm giving the feedback for students, I'm also cataloging that. So then in the future, when I teach that again, I have the previous feedback I gave. And again, it's just as a time saver um, for, my, for me. Um, and it is really, I think, lets me provide better feedback for my students. I'd also recommend that you look to provide you know, informal opportunities for course feedback. So if you can use uh, polls with your students, maybe you survey them, or you have a, an opportunity where they can just give you feedback as to how the course is going. I think that is always helpful. It's helpful for me in making tweaks as we go um, throughout the course. So as we're, we're quickly running out of time here, um, I do want to um, kind of summarize, and we've covered a lot of ground, but as we prepare to wrap up, just a, a few final thoughts would be, first of all, uh, take baby steps. So don't plunge so deeply into the online course environment and expect everything to be for perfect the first time you teach online. Um, in my experience, online teaching is just like teaching a face-to-face -face course in that it's really all about trial and error. Um, you'll take small steps by, uh, you can do things like limiting the amount of technology if you're brand new. So pick and choose the tools that will be uh, most helpful and most critical to success early on. Um, and, and remember that in the end, really the technology, technology shouldn't drive or direct the teaching and the learning process. It should be the support for that process. So be comfortable using just a few tools. Get, get comfortable with a few tools. And then you can add more over time as necessary. Um, I'd also say uh, explore some different approaches and, and strategies. Now, I mentioned a few today, but see what works for you and your teaching style. So obviously, not every approach is going to work for everybody. But the key point here is that whatever approach and strategies you use, uh, make sure that you are, uh, you're using them to help you teach more effective and efficient. Um, otherwise, as I, I mentioned here in my last point, you could run into the problem of overwhelming yourself and your students as well. Uh, so make sure that the course is easy to navigate uh, and that it provides clear expectations and make sure that the overall design of the course makes for a positive experience for everyone. Donna, do I have time to tell you how to set up an automatic email notification if the student posts a question on the discussion board in Blackboard? Um, I don't think I do in the session here, Donna, but what I'll do is in, I'm going to send an email follow-up this afternoon. I'll put those details in that email so you'll have it there. Basically, there's a setup you do when you set up the forum. You enable a setting to allow for subscriptions, and then the students can, um, you then subscribe yourself to the forum. So I'll explain it in the email so you have the step-by-step the -step, um, details. I, I don't want to... Uh, do, it, do an injustice here by not clearly answering. So I'll make sure I, I answer those. Um, and do I have the first few slides so we can share the orientation of Collaborate with, with the students? I do. Uh, Donna, you mean the, the slides at the beginning I shared with, with kind of like where is where do you click and, and that sort of thing? Like uh, this slide. Oh, yeah. I can, yes, I can, uh, I can share these slides as well. So I will. I'll include that in the email I, I send out as well. Great questions. Um, if anyone has any other questions, you can put them in the text chat. I do want to mention a couple of other uh, final items here, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. One is we do have um, archives of this and a, a wide variety of other um, workshops on topics related to online teaching. that are, They are available online, and I'm, I'm pushing out in the text chat um, a, uh, the listing, the link to where you can find all of the topics of past workshops we've offered on various aspects of online teaching. Um, so you can take advantage of that. Um, the recording here that, of today's session will be um, available at this uh, listing 
early this next week. So if you have colleagues that would benefit from this material, you can by all means uh, recommend that they take a look. Uh, and one, one of those archives in particular would be uh, this past November, I, I offered a session on designing exemplary online courses in Blackboard where I, I went into more detail about uh, the nuts and bolts of how you might set up a course in Blackboard following some of the principles that I mentioned today. So that in particular might be an archive um, offered, it looks like in December, um, December 17th of 2013 that you might want to take a look at in that, those lists of archives. And something else I mentioned is uh, I do uh, have available uh, the online course that I developed from scratch this last fall following uh, some, some of Blackboard's best practices for high quality and exemplary online courses. I do have this course available uh, without any students, obviously, uh, but just the course itself, the design available in Blackboard. If anyone would like access to that as a student, just so you can get in and see an example of how it was set up, Isabel, yes, you can see it. I can, I can enroll you in it. If you can just shoot me an email to remind me that you'd like access to that, I will uh, enroll you yet today. And you can get in and, and you can take a poke, uh, poke around and take a look around this particular course. And by the way, this is the course that I actually will, I mentioned in this previous archive about designing exemplary online courses. So send me the email, Isabel, and I'll, I'll put you in there. So uh, with that, uh, if there are any other questions, I, I see we're at the end of our hour, so we're going to wrap up for today, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stop the archive at this point, and uh, I'll stick around for uh, a few more minutes. If anyone wants to uh, follow up, we can, uh, we can do that here offline. But uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you at another faculty development workshop in the future.